Good morning. morning. I'm so excited that after talking about Song of Solomon last week, you guys came back. (laughs) Yeah, I'm going to just say something about you guys. Uh, I'm excited to be jumping in this morning. We are transitioning into the prophets. Uh, So we're moving into the last section of the Old Testament. How many of you guys would love to be able to see the future? Yeah, a couple hands, a couple hands. How many of you would just love to be able to go to a restaurant and see the menu without having to put on glasses? <laughs> I'm at that age where I have to constantly trombone, just kind of move it back and forth, trying to figure out if I can see it. Uh, there are times when it would be great to see the future, uh, like the winning lottery numbers. I would like to know what that is. Uh, or just the end of the movie, so I don't have to waste two hours knowing if it's going to be good or not. Cats, anybody? <laughs> Uh, Or just to know if I need to put on shorts or snow pants in the month of May. Someone said we call it the month of May because you may get sunshine or you may get snow. You may get rain or you may get apocalyptic weather. You never know with the month of May, but today is gorgeous and I love seeing all the shorts. Uh, A sign was up recently outside of a psychic network that said close to unforeseen circumstances. I feel like that somehow discredits their business a little bit. It kind of hurts their credibility. This week, we are starting the last section of the Old Testament. We're talking about the prophets. I want to show you a picture here just to show you guys how far you've come along. You've made it through two-thirds of the Old Testament already. Pretty exciting. Uh, There are at least 63 prophets in the Old Testament, and I'm not going to pop quiz ask you who they are. According to Jude, uh, verse 14, Enoch is the first. Everyone say Enoch. It says in verse 14, Enoch, the seventh son from Adam, prophesied about them. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. We're only five chapters into the Bible, and we already have the first prophet who comes on the scene. The three groups in the Old Testament who represented God's presence, God's power, were the priests, the prophets, and the kings. The priests, the prophets, and the kings. A prophet is someone who speaks on God's behalf. Today we call that a wife. I am surprised at how often the Holy Spirit sounds like my wife, Suzanne. God often speaks to her. Dan, why did you say that? Dan, why did you do that? When we think about the prophets, we think about characters like Merlin. Anyone ever heard of Merlin? Yeah. We think about the oracle from the Matrix. Yeah, the one that you guys probably have not heard of, Face of Bo from Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. There's my real nerds. Thank you. Uh, and their main role is to see the future and to be weird. That's their two main roles. They are like a walking magic eight ball. Will the Bears win the Super Bowl this year? <laughs> Don't count on it. <laughs> We're not going to ask about Green Bay. But a biblical prophet wasn't always there to predict the future. And this is where we often get it wrong. We come to them like they're a magic eight ball, but the prophets oftentimes weren't not about predicting the future. In fact, only 10% of what they talked about have to do with the future. Only 10% of what they talk about have to do with the future. A majority of their messages were, if you repent, God might relent. If you repent, they were there to remind them of the covenant And if they've done the covenant, then there's blessings. But if they've not done the covenant, then there's curses. And they said, if you repent, then God might relent. That's a majority of their messages. They were warning labels. They were a lot like my son when he was younger. I don't know why kids wait till the last minute to use the bathroom, but he comes running up the stairs doing the pee-pee dance, and he sees me kiss my wife. And so he yells down to our oldest and says, Caleb, watch out. Mom and dad are loving each other. Warning him not to walk into the room. It's like, it's just a kiss, man. (laughs) The highest concentration of the prophets take place in a span of about 300 years. It's about a 300 year span where we see a concentration of the prophets. It goes from 750 BC to 450 BC. From 750 BC to 450 BC which is when Israel was invaded by the Assyrians and the Babylonians and they had to deal with the Persians. It's in that concentration of difficulty and hardship that we see God speaking to them through the prophets. See, God would rather speak to us than spank us. God would rather use his words than his wounds. 
As it says in Ezekiel, God takes no delight or pleasure in handing out spiritual spankings. God doesn't want to do this, so he sends the prophets to warn us to give us the opportunity to turn. The prophetic books take up as much space as the New Testament. The prophetic books take up as much space as the New Testament. So while reading through the prophets sometimes feels like watching a foreign film without the subtitles, <laughs> it's like really difficult to understand what's going on, it's super important. It's the reason why Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, and we have the word of the prophets made more certain because of what they talked about with Jesus and Jesus on the scene. So they said, we've been made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. It says to go back to the prophets for some light to shine on our darkness. This morning we're going to start off with Isaiah. Everyone say Isaiah. In the Jewish scriptures, the three major prophets, Daniel's not included, the three major prophets were Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. Jeremiah, Isaiah, and Ezekiel. Jeremiah speaks a lot about God the Father. Isaiah speaks a lot about God the Son. Ezekiel speaks a lot about God the Holy Spirit. We go from Father to Son to Holy Spirit, but this morning we're going to talk about Isaiah and Isaiah is the most quotable of all the Old Testament speakers. He's the most quotable. Uh, who said, I'm not superstitious, but I'm a little stitious? Wow, you guys were really quick on that. No amens this morning, but we got Michael Scott in our back pocket. I'm just glad you didn't say Isaiah. <laughs> there are a lot of famous quotes. The best way to teach your kids about taxes is to eat 30% of their ice cream. Bill Murray. <laughs> The first time I see a jogger smiling, I'll consider it. Joan Rivers. Friends are God's way of apologizing to us for families. Someone not related to my family. Isaiah is one of the most quoted people from the Old Testament. In fact, according to David Sanford, 90% of the New Testament's 260 chapters all reference Isaiah. 90% of the 260 chapters in the New Testament reference Isaiah. Almost one-third of the chapters of the book of Isaiah refer to Jesus or the coming Messiah. One-third of the book of Isaiah. So if you have read the New Testament, you've essentially read Isaiah. You've encountered a lot of Isaiah as you go through the New Testament. So in order to appreciate the New Testament, you need to know Isaiah. You need that background information. His ministry lasted 40 to 50 years. 40 to 50 years. The average pastor only stays five years. But it's because they don't have as many good people like you guys. <laughs> Amen. I've been here a lot longer than five years and you've put up with me. Blessings. <laughs> the name Isaiah means the Lord of salvation. The Lord of salvation. His central message can be found in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. It says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. As humans, we're not always good at labeling things. I'm going to show you a couple of pictures just to give you some examples. We're not always good at labeling things. Look at that bag right there. It says hot dog buns. <laughs> Is that hot dog buns? Not any hot dogs I've ever seen. That one says carrots. Does anybody see what those are? Those aren't carrots. Here's the last one. Tastes like grandma. Homemade jam black raspberry. <laughs> All right, move on. While we laugh, we all are terrible at labeling. We go through life constantly labeling things good, bad, right, wrong, and we don't always get it right. We label something good because it makes us happy, but does it make us holy? Does it put a smile on God's face? Are we using God's standard for labeling, or are we just doing our own preferences? Isaiah is called to go around and let people know where their labels are wrong. How popular do you think he was? His main ministry was going around to say, hey, what you have called right is wrong, and what you've called wrong is right, and we've gotten some things mixed up. He prophesied in Jerusalem while the Assyrians are attacking just to the north of them. 
So there's this major threat just to the north as he's speaking to Judah. The book of Isaiah has been called a miniature Bible. There are how many books in the Bible? 66. How many chapters in the book of Isaiah? 66. It can be divided into two sections, Old Testament, New Testament, which is how many chapters for the New Testament? 27. Good job. I like the confidence. How many for the Old Testament? 39. Isaiah is broken into two sections. It's exactly the same thing. 39 for the first, 27 for the second. And so it's called the miniature Bible, but we're going to start off with Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. So Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. Everyone say Uzziah. Uzziah. If we were to make a list of all of the great kings of Israel, there would be four. There would be four great kings in Israel, and they would be David, Solomon, Hezekiah, and Uzziah. Uzziah was one of the great kings in Israel. He became king when he was only 16 years old. Can you imagine letting a 16-year-old run your country? I mean, it couldn't do any worse than some of the leaders we've had. I'm not going to mention any names. We're not going there this morning. But couldn't do any better. I'm sure uh, he went on to rule for 52 years. 52 years. Over the last 52 years, we have 10 different presidents in our country. They had one leader. One leader for 52 years. It's the only leader they knew. And scripture says that he did what was right in the eyes of God or pleasing in the eyes of God. During his time, there was prosperity. There was protection, provision. You saw things moving up and to the right. The gas prices were great because they rode horses. (laughs) They didn't have to have gas. An ability to retire at an early age and not have to work at Walmart in your twilight years. Things were going really well in their country. But then he dies. And with that great leader that you have depended on for 52 years, what do you do? Because you know that after every great leader has come a bad leader. So what do you do? What, how do you approach the future? And at this time, Assyria is coming in and it's just gobbling up all these areas just around Judah. And so there's this constant threat moving east towards Egypt. What do you do when whatever it is that you've been counting on fails you? Your money, your job, your tenacity, which has always just gotten it for you, your relationships. When everything you've counted on falls apart, what do you do? What's your knee-jerk reaction? What's your instinct? For Isaiah, his reaction is to run to God. He runs to the temple when Uzziah dies. That sets the context for his ministry. In verse 1, it says, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Some people get referred to as the something. And I'm going to list a couple of people. I want you to tell me who they are. So the rock, Dwayne Johnson, the fridge, William Perry, the Hulk, David Banner, not Dan Stanford, David Banner, the king. I'm so glad you didn't say Elvis. It's Jesus. Yeah, it's Jesus. Jesus is the king. And sometimes we forget that. Isaiah chapter 1 through 39 is all about the sovereignty of God. It's all about the king. So even though Uzziah has died, their earthly leader has died, God is still on where? The throne. He is still in charge. And not just Israel, but the nations around it. And he'll talk about several nations all surrounding Israel. And so that God is sovereign even over them. For the whole earth is filled with his glory. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2 through 3. Above him were seraphim, which are angels, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. In English, if you want to emphasize something, there's several things you can do. One is don't use Times New Romans. That's one thing you could do. But you can use capital letters. You can highlight it. You can italicize it. You can use exclamation points. You can use an emoji. There's a lot of things you can do to emphasize what it is that you're talking about. But in Hebrew, they didn't have that. 
They didn't have punctuation. They didn't have uh, commas and periods. They didn't have lowercase letters. In fact, when you looked at original Hebrew, there's no spaces. It's just letter after letter after letter after letter after letter after letter, all in one block. But if you wanted to emphasize something, you repeated it. If you want to emphasize it, you repeat it. And we do the same thing in English sometimes. Sometimes we'll repeat something. How many of you guys remember a show called Brady Bunch? Do you remember what Jan would say of her sister when she got really mad at her? Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. I am so impressed that you guys know that reference. It's so old. <laughs> Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. How many of you don't know what we're talking about? And you got a few hands. Google it later. <laughs> Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Uh, sometimes in the Bible, we'll see repetition where things will be said in twos. You'll notice that Jesus will say, truly, truly, or verily, verily, I say to you. It's his way of emphasizing that what I'm about to say to you is really important. Truly, truly, I say to you. But there's only one time in Scripture where something is repeated three times, and it is here. This is the only time in Scripture where it is repeated three times. And notice that it's not about his mercy, mercy, mercy. Or his love, his love, his love. Or his peace, his peace, his peace. It's his holiness. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Because you can't trust the love if he's not holy. You can't trust the peace if he's not holy. You can't trust the justice if he's not holy. Holy is the foundational characteristic that holds all of the rest together. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The Hebrew word holy is kodesh, which means something that is set apart, uh, something that is heavy, holy other. God is holy. Verse 3 through 5. The whole earth is filled with his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorpost and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke or his presence. And notice how Isaiah responds. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. No, he says, woe to me, woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. One who speaks on God's behalf, a prophet is talking about how his lips are not worthy to be speaking of God. He's not clean. Have you ever thought that you were really good at something? Until you ran into somebody else who was better. Like you were outside and you were shooting some baskets. And you're like, man, I am really good at this. I should be like NBA. And then you go on and you watch like classic basketball. And you see Michael Jordan. You're like, yeah, I'm not that good. You know, or you think you're, you're like a really good singer. And then you turn on the radio and you hear like the vocal range of Ariana Grande. Or you're getting ready in the morning. And you see yourself in the mirror. And you're like, I could be a runway model. And then you come to church and you see the physique of Pastor Dan. And you're like, ah, it's just... I just can't, just can't live up to that. It's just it's, it's a standard. That I was play, you guys shouldn't be laughing at that. I was playing. I read a meme. This is for free. I read a meme where this person was saying that, that you know, if they're ever dealing with like self-esteem issues, they put a bumper sticker on the car that says, honk if you think I'm hot, and they'll just sit at the green light and just wait for everyone to honk at them. So... You could use that if you want. Um, I was playing golf for the first time in like forever. Because the last time I played, I actually, I hit my club onto the green because I was so furious. I don't know how anyone can play golf and be a Christian. I, I don't understand it. <laughs> and so I vowed I would never play again. And, uh, and a friend of mine talked me into coming out of retirement and I went out and I played. And one of my shots landed in a sand trap. But it wasn't just a sand trap. There was like a six-foot bunker in front of it. So you had to go over six feet to get onto the green. So I was just going to chip it to the side. And they started egging me on. And they're like, well, why don't you just try to hit it over? And you know ego. So you're like, all right, I'm going to try and hit it over. I hit the ball. It ricochets off of the six-foot wall, hits me in the forehead, <laughs> knocks me out. And the worst part is waking up my friends over me ready to give me mouth-to-mouth. I'm kidding. I actually hit it over the bunker onto the green. It was a PGA moment. It was one of those moments where everyone's like, wow. And everything after that reminded me why I would not be sponsored by Nike. 
But that one shot was amazing. And for a moment, I thought, maybe I could go PGA. We all have those moments where we feel like we're doing really well. Like, we've mastered this. We are the exception. But then we run into something that reminds us that we're not quite as good as we think we are. Compared to other guys, Isaiah was a model citizen. If you were to put him in a lineup with most other people, he would have stood out as being amazing. He didn't watch adult films. Uh, He didn't vape. He didn't listen to Justin Bieber. Uh, There's a lot of things he didn't do. But then he encounters God. And all of a sudden, his standard isn't matched by culture. His standards is matched by the holy, holy, holy God of the universe. And all of a sudden, he realizes that he's not as moral as he thinks he is. He's not as clean as he thinks he is. Someone wrote this week, I just want to know why my clothes only get caught on the door handle when I'm in a bad mood. (laughs) Anybody ever have that? And it's like right when you're like super frustrated, that's when your jacket gets caught on the door handle. Any other time, you're all fine. But there's these moments that remind you that you're not as holy as you think you are. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us, pastors included, have fallen short of the glory of God. There's a big difference between four-year-old's definition of clean and mom's definition of clean. (laughs) Right? You know, they put it under the bed and in the closet, it's done. And there's a big difference between our definition of holiness and God's definition of holiness. We all have a long ways to go. Thank God for grace. Thank God for grace. Amen? Amen. So he says, woe is me. That's the prophetic word that you would use to curse something, to pronounce condemnation upon something. Woe to Edom. Woe to Moab. Woe to Isaiah. This is the only time someone refers to themselves as being woe. It's usually reserved for nations. And he says of himself, my soul is ruined. I'm under condemnation. Woe is me. Seeing the holiness of God has caused him to see himself in a true light. To see the darkness, to see the shadows, to see where he needs to grow, the true condition of who he is. And sometimes we need that wake-up call to realize that we all have a long ways to go. And if we're honest... We too would say like Isaiah, woe is me except for Jesus. Jesus is what keeps me from having to say, woe is me. A young boy was in the backyard and he was playing baseball by himself. And he would say to himself, I am the greatest batter in the world. He'd throw the ball up in the air, he'd take a swing and he'd miss. I am the greatest batter batter in the world. He threw the ball up in the air, he swung and he missed. I'm the greatest batter in the world. He threw the ball up in the air and he swung and he missed. He says, wow, I must be the best pitcher in the world because I just struck out the best batter in the world. It's hard to admit weakness. It's hard to admit where we need to grow and where we fall short. We all need Christ. I find that people who desire God to have ultimate control of their life tend to leave certain areas. I mean, if we think of your life like a house, most of us are like, God, come into the foyer. God, come into the living room, but stay out of the attic. Don't go in the basement. Don't check out the closets. Don't go into the office. There's areas that we make off limits, and God doesn't work that way. God says, if I'm going to move in, I want all of it because I've given you all of me. There, there, there's no holding back. And so the question I want to ask is, where are you refusing to let go? Where are you refusing to allow God into your life? What's keeping you from living the life that he wants from you and for you? A question that haunts me is, the closer someone gets to me, do they see more Christ-likeness or less Christ-likeness? You see, all of us can look Christ-like from a distance. But what about the people who get into the nitty-gritty of your life? who see you when you don't get the golf ball over the six-foot thing and it hits you in the forehead and you get knocked out, who see the real you, do they see Jesus? It's one thing to seem Christ-like from a distance, but how about up close? The same holiness that inspired him to say, woe is me, is the same holiness that that caused the angels to sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Verse 6 through 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, 
which he had taken with tongs from the altar where the sacrifice took place. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. God is a redeemer. God is in the rescue business. He doesn't hear Isaiah say, woe is me. And they said, yeah, you're right, buddy. Woe is you. Smite him. But rescues him as soon as he admits that he needs help. As soon as he admits his weakness, he admits the gap. God comes to his rescue. Imagine that I have a dream. And in this dream, I see heaven is full of clocks. And all throughout heaven are all these clocks, and I'm, and I'm walking through, and I'm noticing all these clocks, and they all have different names by them. And I ask St. Peter, what's up with all these clocks? He says, well, they're not really clocks. They're centimeters. And every time a person sins, it ticks, so we know how many sins they've committed. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's pretty interesting. And so I notice that there's you know, all these different people. I have their names, and, and I see the hallway full of centimeters. And, and so I go up to Pastor Jason's. And I see his centimeter, and after 10 minutes, it ticks. And I'm like, oh, Pastor Jason. And then another 15, 20 minutes, it ticks again. I know, I know. And then I keep walking, and all of a sudden, I see Tamara's. Five five minutes go by, and it ticks. Another five minutes, and it ticks. She's in a business meeting. Another five minutes, it ticks. (laughs) And then I see my wife's. I know, I know. I know. After a minute, tick. After a minute, tick. After a minute, tick. She's married to me, so there's like after a minute, tick. But I don't notice my own clock or my own centimeter. And so I go to Peter. I was like, hey, is this because I have reached a level of holiness that I don't need to have one of these centimeters anymore? And he starts laughing. He says, no, we use yours as a fan. It's in the office. (laughs) Tick, 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 tick. I don't know about you, but there are times where I need God to rescue me. Amen. Amen? I like 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. The Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials. God knows how to rescue his kids from trials. Throughout history, God has come to the rescue of his people. He rescued Noah from the flood. He rescued Daniel from the lion's den. He rescued Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. He rescued Peter from prison. He rescued Lazarus from the grave, and he promises to rescue us from sin. To not only forgive us, but to free us and to redeem us. As Christians, we can sometimes complicate what it means to be a Christian. My favorite is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 through 10. says, For it is by grace you have been saved. Everyone say grace. Grace. Through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. Everyone say gift. Not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Not saved by good works, but saved for good works that God prepared in advance for us to do. So in verse 8, we see Isaiah's response. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. How many of you guys have ever done something dangerous? What's the most dangerous thing you've ever done? Was it running into a burning building? Was it showing up to Lambeau Field with a Bears jersey? Was it letting the person next to you drive? That could be scary. I think the most dangerous thing I have ever done took place in the middle of the woods in Krivitz, Wisconsin, when I said, God, here am I, send me. Whatever you want with my life, I am yours. Here's a blank check. Isaiah has no idea what's on the other side of his saying, here am I, send me. He doesn't know what that means. When Connor was five years old, he's my middle son. When he was five years old, he was in kindergarten. And he went up to his teacher and he complained that his tummy was bothering him. And she said, well, did you have milk because he's lactose intolerant? He said, yeah, I had some milk because he still loves it. And she said, well, you know, have a little bit of water. He has some water. He says, my tummy still doesn't feel very good. So she said, all right, let's take you to the nurse. And as soon as she went from carpet to tile, he was like a fire hydrant, just all over the tile. 
She was like, thank God we got you to the tile before that happened. She walks him to the nurse. She comes back and half of the class are standing in his sickness (laughs) asking, why is the floor so slippery? At that moment, you feel as a teacher, like, is what I'm teaching sinking in? You know, is, is like, what am I saying? Is it, is it getting across? And what's interesting to me about the ministry of Isaiah is he's told before he's sent that the people aren't going to listen to him. Could you imagine if God came to me and he says, Dan, I've got a sermon for you, but no one's going to listen to it? How motivated am I going to be to get up and share that message? You know, they're going to boo you the whole time. And Isaiah is sent to a people who are standing in their own sickness. And he's to tell them, you're standing in your sickness. Get out of it. God wants to rescue as he just rescued me. But they refuse to listen. They refuse to listen. You see, most people don't like to be told what to do. Most people don't like someone to come along and say, you've mislabeled some things in your life. Let me correct that for you. We especially don't like it on Facebook. We don't want people going around being moral police. And Isaiah's called to come in and to share, and it's going to lead to a martyr's death. According to Jewish history, he will be king, killed by King Manasseh. He'll be sawn in half because of King Manasseh. He would spend three years walking around in his underwear, what Scripture refers to as naked, as a message that he's supposed to send. He would preach to a generation who would ignore his warnings. And yet he had a bigger impact than any of the other prophets. His impact is seismic, unmeasurable. He says more about Jesus in the Old Testament than any other prophet. Isaiah writes 700 years before Jesus shows up. 700 years before. And he's been called the fifth gospel because he talks about Jesus so much. He's called the fifth gospel. So you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Isaiah. They talk about Jesus. Isaiah will give us the most famous Christmas poem. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. Isaiah will give us the verse that we say every Good Friday. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. For but but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Same author. I think my favorite verse in Isaiah is chapter 49, verse 16. I have engraved you in the palm of my hands, God says. I have engraved you in the palm of my hands. Our relationship with God is not written on Etch-A-Sketch. Every time your world begins to get shaken, your name doesn't get erased. He doesn't sit up in heaven with a bunch of petals saying, I love him, I love him not. I love them, I love them not. I love her, I love her not. He says that his love is etched into the palm of his hands quite literally when Christ was crucified on the cross. That's how much. He loves you, unwilling to live without you. He paid too high of a price to let you go. It is the anchor for our hope, and hope can help you cope when you feel like you're at the end of your rope. I want to end with another one of my favorite Isaiah passages, chapter 52, verse 10. It says, the Lord will, bear his, will lay bare his holy arm. In other words, God's going to roll up his sleeves. And the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. I grew up in the 70s and 80s where guys could not keep their shirts on when they had to fight. Anybody ever see a movie from the 70s or 80s? As soon as a fight was about to take place, their shirt came off. For thousands of years, people would wear heavy chain mail into battle. Thousands of weight or hundreds of pounds of weight going into battle, but not in the 70s and 80s. That shirt's coming off. My favorite was Bruce Lee. If somebody messed with Bruce Lee, he would rip his shirt off, and then he would flex, and he'd be like, Wah! and you knew someone was going to taste the bottom of his shoe. You killed my father. I kill you. <laughs> like, it's like, it was, it was going to be on, and someone was going to get hurt. And, and Isaiah says that God is about to roll up his sh- sleeve, and he's about to flex his muscles. 
God's people have been bullied, and God says, I have stands all I can stands, and I can't stands it no more. But Rich Mullins captures this in a song. Rich Mullins captures this in a song when he, it called Awesome God. He says, when he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the ritz. Our God is an awesome God. I used to think that was the weirdest lyric I had ever heard. You know, he ain't putting on the ritz. What in the world is ritz? All I know is ritz crackers. I was like, that makes no sense. The word ritz means to impress. God doesn't roll up his sleeves to impress, but to bless. He's not rolling up to kiss his bicep, but he's coming to the rescue of his people. Isaiah says God has rolled up his sleeve and he's getting ready to intervene for his kids. I love that. I love that. So as we read through the book of Isaiah this week, let us say like Isaiah, here am I, send me, but let us do so knowing that God has rolled up his sleeves and he's getting ready to flex on the behalf of his kids. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you that you've rolled up your sleeves, that you've engraved us in your hand, that you are an awesome God. And Father, we pray that, like Isaiah, that we would say, here am I, send me. Send me because you have touched my lips with your coal, that you have made me holy, not because of me, but because of you and your sacrifice. God, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your calling. We thank you for people like Isaiah who are willing to go. In your name, amen.